No, he was once a musician on the pitch and he's turned into a real musician. Stewie Byrne, you're in studio with me. How are you? Thanks, Andy. Yeah. I don't know about that being a musician on the pitch or a musician off the pitch, to be honest. But. Well, you're turning into a musician over the last couple of years or a couple of months, even. You've brought out an, an EP album on the way and now you have your first live gig. Yeah, first live gig, yeah. Dipped my toe in the water um, this Saturday in the Workman's Club. Um, but a nice way to do it uh, is celebrating. Um, Shelburne are having a social night, um, so fans of the club, people associated with the club, um, having a little bit of a celebration to celebrate 125 years. So they asked me to do it. I thought it was a good opportunity to maybe just um, do a few tracks and just see how it goes. That's it. You know, I'm not really. Um, I've got a kind of an open mind about all of this. Really, it's just something that I've, I've kind of always wanted to do. Felt like I always had to do, and um, just see where it goes from there. I'm not putting myself under under any sort of stupid pressure or anything like that. Like you know, is this the first time you've played with a live band? It's the first time I've played live, and I'll be on my own. So okay, so yeah, it's not a long while no, band at all. No, then? It'll, I'll be on my own. So uh, it'll be kind of a couple of acoustic numbers, and I might get a bit of a help out for a couple of others. But so I'll be on my own. Yeah, and be first time that I've ever been up in front of a a big crowd, like you know. Um, would have played, obviously everyone plays guitar in front of people at parties and stuff like that, like, you know, so this will be a complete new experience for me. How does the nerve compare to the likes of taking to Lansdowne Road in 2004? <laughs> so I haven't a clue, so I'm, ho I'm hoping, I'm hoping the, that experience through the football and doing the media stuff and that kind of thing will sort of give me some sort of preparation for it, you know, under lights, there's lights here, there's lights in studios and, and you do get used to it, you get kind of comfortable with it and I'm just hoping that that, you know, goes a, a long way towards making me feel some way at ease, but it will be very nervous, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, performing live is a completely different thing, especially when it's, it's just you on your own with a guitar and it's acoustic, so um, uh, you can hear a pin drop and you can hear all the little different mistakes that I'm obviously going to make but um, I, I've, it's something that I've always wanted to do so I'm looking forward to doing it. At the same time as being nervous I'm, lo I'm looking forward to doing it. Just talk to us a bit about your background in music because as I mentioned it kind of came about about a year ago or over a year ago the, you started writing your own songs and writing your own music so did you always have an interest in that? Yeah I've always written, I've always written so I've al it's, it's always been my own um, little thing to do um, since it was since I learned the guitar when I was probably 16, 17. Um, so much so, one of the songs that uh, would be on the album, I wrote when I was 19, so it's, I don't want to give me age away, but it's over 20 years old, right. like, you know. Um, but there's, there's things like that. I've always done it, I've always done it quietly to myself. Um, I'm not this kind of person that will go into a room and pick up a guitar and say, you know, get the party going, or I don't think I'm this sort of person that sort of craves the, the, the limelight and all that. I think I do it for a different reason. I think it's a, it's, um, it's a wonderful way to um, express yourself, to get things off your chest, to just to explore different things in your own space, you know, quietly writing songs with just a guitar, like, you know, and I really, I've loved that part of it, like, you know, I thought it's been really, um, just been really helpful, like, you know, so I've always enjoyed doing that, and I think, I think I'll always do it, so, um, writing the album came about because I've just, I just kept, about, I mean, I've been written, writing songs for a while, but about three years ago, even, could even be three and a half years ago now, I started to really get stuck into it. Um, there was a bit of a void in my life there that wasn't there, you know, something to kind of really kind of get me going. I, um, you know, football had ended, I was doing various other things, but I really got stuck into this and it's just led me to here, simple as that. So I've just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, as an ambition to kind of, um, not to just do maybe one song or two songs, but to, to kind of, I come from the, 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 the old school ethos that like, you know, Start something new. An album it. is the thing, like, you know, when I was, you know, growing up in the eighties it was probably it was an album, you had to produce an album. It's probably a bit different now, but I think I've always had that in the back of my head that I love to produce a, a block of work, you know, rather than just do maybe one or two and really see um if I could do it. Um so I haven't done it well, I've done it, but I don't know what people would think about it, but um I'm happy with it. I'm I'm really I'm really chuffed with it, you know. And why did you choose now to kinda bring it out to the public if you've been writing for so long? I don't know. I think I think What's happened is, I think it's just come out. I think um, I could have done it 20 years ago. I didn't. I, I chose football. Um, I could have done it 10 years ago. Um, I didn't. So other things were gone. And, and I, I, I think it's a mixture between thinking uh, you're not good enough. Um, singing is a very, um, 
it's a very private thing to some people and you know when you're expressing yourself um, vocally to a lot of people um, you you really are you know giving away everything like you know and I think there are certain kinds of people that there are people that are they're so extroverted there's no problem to them they don't care if they make mistakes they can do it I, I'd be a little bit different like you know I, I would have wouldn't have felt I, I was would be good enough or um, whatever the case and I'm sure there's a lot of people that there things I'm, I'm still not good enough but that's fine but music is very subjective like that you know and I think what what, ha what has happened is through the process of songwriting and doing the songs um, I think I got a little bit of confidence in my own voice to say, do you know what, maybe I, I, I should take this a bit further. And it's just what's happened is one step has led to another and I find myself here um, in a good place. I'm glad to be here. And so I'm, I'm just going to keep going with it and just see, see where it goes. Like, you know, it's fun and I'm enjoying it. And listening to your EP, some of the songs are actually quite personal. Yeah. So is yeah. that something that you found tough? to even just expose yourself, expose that side of yourself to the world. Well, yeah, it's a really good point. That's exactly what it is, like, you know, and that's another part of, the, of writing music is, um, I personally find it's a better way to, um, to express um, how you're feeling, but it can be interpreted different ways. Like, you know, a lot of people will write, sports people write books. Um, I couldn't write a book. I think I would hurt too many people. Um, <laughs> I, I think, it w and that would hurt me, because yeah. um, it would be just too much to the point. Whereas through music, it's um, it's different. It's it's it can be interpreted, it can be hidden, it can be um, you know kind of delivered in a in a in a in a softer uh, a softer way, so to speak. Like you know, and, and I think that's part of it. I think that's that's part of why um, the music is is um, it's going to help me sort of um, articulate myself in a certain way. Your sister Kellyanne, she's musical as well, a yeah. DJ, a well-known DJ as well. So, would she have helped you along the way, or would that have played into your? Uh, no, she didn't know I was doing it. Oh, she no, didn't know it at no, all. She didn't know I was doing it at all. I was quite surprised at her. She was probably one of the first person. She was probably the first person I told I was I had done it. So um, I did send her the stuff about a year ago. She was away on holidays, and uh, she was really surprised, and she was pleasantly surprised, like you know. So I would have told her about it, but. Um, it's not. It's not a case that we uh, um, sort of bounced off each other. Like you know, she'd have. Well, she wouldn't have different musical taste. I mean, quite similar musical taste to me. Like you know, but um, I suppose her art is is the DJ and is the slightly different art to um, maybe writing music. You know, um, an acoustic guitar or whatever that yeah. that might be. Like you know, but um, I'm sure our paths are going to cross now that we've. Um, um, I've got a sort of body of music out there and you never know, there could be something in there that we could sort of do together, like, you know. And since this is for the anniversary of Shelburne, 125 years, I thought we'd chat a bit about your time there. You joined the club and basically from the moment that you stepped in, the progression and improvement in the club led to three Premier Division trophies within mm. a couple of years. How do you reflect on your Shelburne career? Um, oh, very proud, I have to say. Um, personally, very proud. They're the best days of my life. Best of, of, of um, not just my football and career. Probably the best days of my of my of my life. And um, they were fantastic. They were tough, hard, um, and probably wouldn't have had it other, any other way. But um, they were great days. Um, but proud also because um, I f I feel anyway that we sort of we we certainly took football on a level from where it had been, um, and. Um, I think the important thing about that is that you know when, when you set standards for others, others take it on board, and then they set standards for others. And so I, I do feel proud to be uh, to be part of that and to if, um, to have sort of uh, brought the standard of, of um, football up, um, despite all the adversities and the difficulties that um, the the football community, the soccer community, finds in this country. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of ne negatives out there, but there are an awful lot of positives. Um, and the European stuff was um, specifically important because um, I just feel that I feel that subsequently also led to that improvement in Europe that John McGrover's, um, um, you know, went and did in, in back in 2011, 2012. Then, then you had the likes of Dundalk and taking it on a step further. Um, and I think that's really important. So once, you know, when I look back, I look. I'm I'm very proud to play for the football club. Um, I have a, a very very soft spot for the football club, like because it looked after me. I felt I gave it back. You know, whatever it gave me, I gave back. Um, 
And I don't know, there's just something about the place. Something about the place is quite magical, like, you know, there's some yeah. fantastic magical nights there, you know. I want to focus probably on three different parts of your Shell's career. Firstly, we'll start with, as you mentioned, the European run in 2004. Myself and yourself did a documentary on this on Off the Ball a few months ago. Is that probably one of the best European runs that an Irish team is likely to go on? Um, I'd be biased. Um, I'd say it's definitely if you know it's definitely up there with with um, well anything that has probably come before. Um, see, everything is relative. Like you know, you have to look at it relative to the time, um, relative to what had happened even before. That not much had happened really. Like you know, um, well, if you compare, say, to the likes of Dundalk's run a few years ago, when they come up and give a good fight against Zenit. People were astounded that an Irish club were able to put it up against yeah. a club like Zenit. But you just put it up to a Deportivo team that were almost fighting for the Champions League the year before that. I think that's what people forget, yeah. I think, and I, I hate to be the one to kind of, you know, you have to kind of remind people of, of exactly what we, we were up against. But yeah, you, like you've said it, like, you know, effectively, the, the team, that team, that Deportivo team, had gotten to the semi final of the competition. Um, had been, and were knocked out of the semi-final by the winners, Porto, the, you know, Jose Mourinho's yeah. Porto. So when we drew them, we were, um, you know, we were excited, yeah, but we were, we were shocked, couldn't believe we were getting this team at, at, at this stage of the competition, you know. Um, and so we very quickly had to prepare for the game and basically come up with, um, you know, a game plan to try and beat them. Um, and... You know, with a little bit of luck in the first game, it could have gone a different way. I think, I think we could have won. The, we should have won the first game at least one 0 We probably should have gone over there with a goal. Um, and then you, 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 you're over there and you're 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 going head to toe with them, like you know, and it's nil all at half time over there. And all of a sudden, you're just you're trying to think of. Um, you're sort of readjusting your game plan because you've gotten through the first leg, you've gotten halfway through the second leg, and you know you're you're now tactically saying okay. You know, uh, we need to sort of maybe adjust things to try and, and 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 get a goal here, and maybe you know give yourself every opportunity to go through. And unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. Look, I think their quality told in the end, you know, and maybe a little bit of naivety and inexperience at that level and at that stage of a competition told with us. Um, and subsequently, we got we 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 got outdone. Um, but we, you know, we were very proud of it, and like so much so, we were um, after the game, we were disgusted. We were genuinely deflated by. It. We didn't come out the pitch saying, you know, look, we've been beaten by one of the top teams in Europe here. We were really, really, really um, devastated that we that we that we didn't push them a little bit closer. Like, you know, I yeah. think that probably tells you where where our headspace was. Well, time. if you watch back the post match interviews from Owen Harry at the time, yeah, it tells a tale of where your mindset was that you actually felt like you just could have gone on further in yeah, the competition yeah, and made we were, it to the group stages. That's how we were thinking. That's really, and, that, and especially at half-time, that's how we were thinking, you know. Um, we were devastated, absolutely devastated. And, and it was probably good that Owen that went out and, and, and gave the interview because he was able to sort of articulate that for the group. Yeah. But we were really, really good at you know. Do you think that this run by Shelburne in 2004, do you think that it acts as sort of a, not a starting block as such, but sort of a beginning of Irish sides having a bit of a say in Europe and being respected by other European leagues yeah, as it, potential can or potential candidates for group stages at least it, it became it became a belief thing so i think i think you know and i i i felt this personally as a player when i was you know 18 19 and uh, i i i was um so I was bows as a kid and we, I played in Europe at Bowes as, a, as an 18 year old and uh, I just felt that the, we were going out to be beaten. We were, just, we were of that semi-professional mindset. It was a trip away to, to Minsk, it was a bit of crack, you know, but um, I just didn't think that we gave ourselves any opportunity. So there was, a, there was a real lack of belief among League of Ireland clubs that they could really pit it with the best. Um, and there was two things wrong there, you know, tactically, and conditioning wise we weren't at the same level you know especially tactically and technically that kind of you know those tactically technically and physical condition there are three real things that were probably the, but probably the most important thing was that belief and confidence you know we just never we were never confident enough to go up against the best so 
I think when I think when we did what we did, I think that changed the mindset and said, "Hang on a second, we can do this." Like you know, in fairness, we we've gone full time, so I think we were ticking, we were starting starting to tick the, tech, the technical box and the tactical box, um, and the physical condition was there because we were fitter. But ultimately, more than anything, that belief that you you know, at the end of the day, it's eleven v eleven. It's me against another guy. It's him against another guy, and it's just. Um, I think you, you you when you play in Europe, you you develop a bigger understanding for the tactical side of the game. You know, um, very much the domestic game was torn up four four two and just go and play. Yeah. But what had happened at that period was the game was becoming much more technical. Coaches were becoming uh, brought up um, to speed on dif difficult different formations. You had started to do video evidence on 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 opponents, and you were really starting to. Um, dive deep into the different sort of elements of the game and we had done that in preparation for that run and you could really see that um you know we had prepared right and we had a better understanding of um of our opponents and how they played and and what we can do to kind of um to counteract that and maybe go get a goal so all those things i think um sort of led to a sort of an improved performance in europe and ultimately led to you know better you know um, performance by other clubs as well yeah i think you can sort of see that in the likes of dundalk's run under stephen kenny that yeah. they were they were built physical uh they were big physical players that were far fitter than anyone else in the league of ireland they yeah. were currently they've they've finished a video uh evidence room now in dundalk they have a new fitness center so you're kind of seeing this evolution again further on from where you were back then but I want to move on to th 2006 and the aforementioned Stephen Kenny because he plays a big role in this season. <laughs> <laughs> I'll and, never live this down. <laughs> and particularly at the end of the season, yeah. that famous interview with you telling Tony that you're angry. Yeah. How do you reflect on that? <laughs> well, I was angry. <laughs> Are you still angry? I'm not still angry, no, no, no. I'm older and wiser now. Um, uh, I was... <laughs> I was fuming at the time. I was, yeah. I was just, I th you know, a lot, an awful lot had gone on in the club that year, um, um, that week even. And yeah. for, you know, just for a bit of background, what happened was Dublin City had gone bust that year. Oh, loads had gone wrong. Uh, yeah. Shelburne yeah. had beaten them twice, yeah. six points. Derry City under Stephen Kenny had only beaten them once and gotten beaten by them. Uh, yeah, so three they had three points. So there's a bit of a, a mix up on who's on what points. But eventually it boils down to the last game of the season. Yeah, yeah. We had points taken off us and then we, we, we lost six points. Um, but effectively, Derry gained six points, you know, um, through, through, a, through an admin um, alteration. And yeah, exactly. And it was that and it was it was the financial stuff had been going on in the club. Um, on a personal level, myself and um, Owen Heary and uh, Ollie Cal, uh, Dave Rogers, we were... Uh, we had been sort of uh, meeting with the club in the background over, the, and I think we had come. We knew we knew it, it was gone, like you know. So, um, and there was also the the frustration of the previous year, where we, you know, we sh to be honest, we should have we sh we should have walked that league. We didn't like we didn't turn up that league like that that year, and so there was all this sort of you know there was all this frustration and. Um, there was a lot going on, and I just think, I think in me personally, it just kind of it all came out that night. Like, you know, I'd one man at the match. That's the reason why I was interviewed. Yeah. So, um, I just, I think it just came out. That was it. That was it. it. Just came out. I couldn't, I couldn't keep it in. I had to come out. Um, I felt I had to kind of defend the club. Like, and you know, I think just think the club. My time with the club, you know, um, as much as it's great to talk about it now, and we look back at. The, the great things that we that we that we achieved, and and that is great, and that's that's the most important thing. But at the time, there was a lot of negative um, stuff towards shells like that. We paid the most money. We bought players. Ollie Bourne was always griping and you know f you know um, getting favors done his way, and that was it. Was just wasn't true, like you know, and 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 it just felt on the night I had to kind of defend the club, um, and that's what came out. I mean. I look back and I, I don't think you have enough of that in football anymore. It's all very much, yeah, yeah, blah, 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 you know, this is great, that's great, everything's great. Like, you know, people don't sort of speak out enough and, and express their emotion enough, like, you know, so you kind of miss that. Well, Ollie Byrne was actually going to be the third thing that I wanted to talk about because he plays a big part in your Shell's career. Uh, Shelburne, 
He, they were, they had a fantastic squad, but that squad obviously doesn't come from anywhere. It needs funding behind the scenes, mm. and after the success comes a bit of a downfall. Um, a dark period for the club. I was awful. I was awful. Yeah, um, and it was immediate as well because Ollie, Ollie passed away probably within six months of that game. Because that game was in November. No, I think he, I think Ollie passed into June of uh, the next year. He uh, with a, he, he, a tumor in his brain, and he was he, he took he took ill immediately, like you know, and obviously the the, the stresses and strains of, of running the club um, took its toll on him, um, and the club was devastated by it, like you know, because he was a he's a larger than life character, Ollie, like you know, Ollie was um, a real scrapper and a fighter and a clever, uh, um, incredibly intelligent man. You, you just wouldn't he was very well read up on the law, um, and used that to his advantage, especially when he had to go head to head with the FAI mm -hmm. um, and I would be of the opinion, I'll tell you this now, if he was still around some of the stuff that's gone on now would never have gone on like you know I think the the league misses somebody like that, somebody that really fights for the game, you know the football game, the rights of the clubs and the players and then he, he very much did that like you know he defended his, his own football club but um, he was brilliant at, at sort of um, Defending the club and the players, like you know, and he's, he was a great loss. Now, look, listen, Ollie did things arseways. He did, um, but it's kind of a strange, it's a strange relationship that um, football has with him. And when you look back, it's you look back with, um, oh, I look back with fondness. Now I look back at some of the silly, stupid things that he did, um, but for a long time it worked. He got away with it. I think maybe it was a there was a year or two where he just got completely ran away with himself. And maybe this maybe the illness was playing its toll there. I don't know. But if you ask any player that's that's come through the club and has left the club, none of them look back and talk negative about Ollie. Yeah. Um, and that's that's him. You know, he looked after players. He did it. He bent over backwards for them. Like you know. Um, and I suppose that that's his that's his legacy, really, isn't it? That, that 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 the players think of him in a different way, completely, you know. Yeah. Well, even when we were doing the documentary, yourself and Owen Harry were chatting away about various different things that he, you remember him doing. And if you look at it now in today's light, it sounds outrageous. <laughs> but I think again, you have to put context in it that these were different times. It's different it's times. almost fifteen, yeah. twenty years ago now. Yeah. And that that kind of carry on was just seen as being, you know, a, a part of his personality, a part of the larger life, and people didn't really take it as a serious thing. Yeah, yeah. The um, I suppose what it was was like, in a lot of ways, he was ahead of his time. Like you know, Ali, Ali put, you know, Ali was the first, that brand new stand that was built behind um, the goal was state of the art at the time. Um, he put a commercial box into it, mm -hmm. you know, it was way beyond anything anyone in the league had done. That, I mean, that, that was put in in 2002, you know, and you, you, you know, we spoke about the lift. The, the, lift, the lift was brilliant because uh, it was 05, 06, we hadn't been paid. And all of a sudden there's this food lift going in to the stand that will bring food up to the, the commercial <laughs> box. It cost about 50,000 euro, like, you know, we're going, haven't paid us. No, what's and so that was the, and he'd be ah, it's all right, like, and he'd be sort of trying to butter his way around, you know. It was just madness, but you could see what he was trying to do, and it, it, um, you got no help in them days. It was him trying to bring shells to another level, um, you know, we had tr we had done it on the pitch, and he was trying to kick it on again, and that's the reason why I signed for shells because from playing against Shelbourne, you know, shells they turn up and they'd be in the the best of gear and they'd had the skips and the kit men would arrive two hours before the game like you know none of this stuff was this is all unheard of like this is back in the mid late 90s completely unheard of and I'm just going I, I want to play I, that's, that's who I want to play for like you know so to, in a way the reason the club was as successful as it was be, was because he pushed the standards and um, the reason the club collapsed so badly is because he went too far. Yeah, you know. Well, it was the sign of the times. It was almost. It was a sign. It was almost you know. exactly it was, it was the same. It was a global as collapse. The, yeah. the entire country, yeah. people kind of yeah. ran away with themselves. Yeah. But eventually, over many many years of rebuilding, shells are finally back in Premier Division this year under Ian Morris. How do you think they're going to get on? Uh, it'll be tough for them, you know. Any 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 step up from the fourth division to the Premier Division is always um, 
it's a it's a different style of football and it can it can be difficult. But I think they're well placed to do. I think they've 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 um, they've effectively the, the, you know, the squad that they had in the fourth division was um, in the majority made up of what I would say be good Premier Division players. You know, so they're 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 making that step up and they signed a couple of brought a couple in. Um, I think what's really positive this time around. Is that there's a good vibe behind the club again? Like you know, the club are now out of debt. I'd like to say the memory of the bad years is starting to fade, which I think is really important because I think you you have to move on as a club at some stage. You can't continuously look back and say, you know, be negative about why did we do that and you know, um, and blame him and blame them for getting this and this. You know, that you have to move on from that. You can't progress if you're constantly stuck in the past. You know, so. Um, I think that's important for the football club. So, and they really are starting to find their identity back again. Um, I think there's a the hundred this hundred and twenty fifth anniversary thing is has focused everybody on the positives and the fact that the, the club has been around for one hundred and twenty five years. Yeah. You know, it's only it's only ourselves and and and, and Bowes, um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, who's the club is you know over a century years old, which is absolutely stunning and incredible, and it shows you the adversity of both football clubs and and. and the difficult times they've come through. I mean, how many world wars is that? There's probably is it, you know, two. There's a two and a couple of other little things in the you know, a couple of civil wars and whatever yeah. it might be. But in between, yeah. So I think that's important as well. And if you look at the likes of Bose over there, they've obviously had a key strategy behind the scenes over the last couple of years. And you look at them now, and they're a completely different club to where they were five years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That can be something the shells can look at, and I know they have a oh, good, they have a good financial backer, but that doesn't mean they have to go out and spend man, uh, spend mad money again. No, it just means that they can find a steady strategy that they can build on. Completely, and to give Bowes their credit, they have, you know, they haven't spent money, you know, in the in the in the five years. What they've done is they've culturally transitioned the football club yeah. through a lot of hard work, through volunteerism, um, and I hope tip my hat to them. I have to say. Um, I might get a bit of stick off shells fans for that, but sure, that's what you do. That's the way it goes. But um, I certainly think um, there are things there that you can use with bows. I mean, obviously, bows is bows, shells are shells, um, and shells will do their own thing. You know, different things may work for different clubs, but um, um, certainly that's the way forward. And you know, that's the um, it, you don't have to try your money at things to achieve certain things. Well, it's going to be great to have that rivalry back as well. Brilliant! Oh yeah, best. I mean, they, the, 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 the shells and bows derbies that I played in were just. Incredible. The great, probably the greatest memory I have in the game is we played she uh, Bowes and Dalyman Park. It was a bit of a game decider, and uh, we were both in the same tunnel because uh, that was probably the f they brought us through to the same tunnel. It was live on television, and you know when you're in the Bowes tunnel now, well, all you see ahead of you is the far side. I think it's the, it's the connect end, and it's always empty because it's dilapidated. The greatest memory I have is actually. Um, Seeing that full of shell supporters, I couldn't believe it. there must have been about four thousand, you know, three four thousand shell supporters in that in that stand alone. In brilliant, great game, a game that we won, which is great. But uh, the memory, the memory of standing there looking through that tunnel and seeing that packed daily mount, you know, you can't you can't beat memories like that. Well, speaking of daily mount, there's also been good developments over the last uh, week that daily mount is going to receive a, a big chunk of money from the government to try to develop that new stadium. It's going to be shell shared between shells and bows going forward. It's not going to be done next year or the mm. year after, but that's going to be a massive thing to develop football in that particular area and also help these clubs find some sort of, you know, just a base that they can be proud of again because yeah. the likes of Toka Park, it's old, but it's run down. Yeah. Same with Daly Mount Park. If they have this hub that's going to be a brilliant new stadium, then it's something they can build on going as, going forward yeah. as well. And it's a model. It's a model for other clubs to 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 um to repeat. Like you know, when I spoke to you about um, setting standards in football for others to, to emulate, this is the same thing. Like you know, and touch wood, it it gets a bit of traction. Like you know, I think it's hit a bit of a stumbling block. It's kind of sort of festering in no man's land for the last probably couple of years now and it really needs an owner to grab a hold of it yeah. and say let's get this going let's move it forward i think the positives are that it's it's probably it seems from from what i know anyway it's detached from the fai nonsense that's going on and it's very much dublin city council the government and the two clubs so um if they can get that over the line it'll be fantastic um and it'll just it'll be a very good um 
very good representation of how a good football model can work, bringing in a community. I mean, the, 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 the plans look fantastic, they look brilliant. Um, so hopefully that is something that they can push on uh, quite quickly. Yeah, well, between that and Tala, it'll make Dublin the key home for football in Ireland because the rest of the stadiums in the League of Ireland yeah. are really, really poor. And it's something that really needs to be developed for the league to develop as well. Yeah, I totally agree, yeah. Um, but I think that's where we'll leave it off because... Um, We've rambled on about shells for long enough for one week. I'm sure the Bose fans won't be happy with me. <laughs> no. uh, if people want to see your gig, how do they get tickets? They can get tickets on the uh, Shells website. So if you're a Bose fan, you're <laughs> in trouble. <laughs> well, there's pl there'll be plenty of Bose around the Workman's Club, I'm sure. Anyway, the, you know, they're known as the Hipster Club, oh, and that's, right, a, that's right, the right. Hipster. Yeah, uh, I better bring a few bodyguards. <laughs> Stewie, thanks very much no for coming. No problem, Cheers.